All right. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in. I've been wanting to do this book review since I got the book um, this summer, but I unfortunately didn't have time to read it until just the other day when we went um, we went for a little trip. So I had time to read it on the plane, which was great. So I can finally give you my thorough and honest review of Jordanetics by Vox Day. I love the subtitle, A Journey into the Mind of Humanity's Greatest Thinker. I actually really like the foreword by Milo as well because um, it's very sassy, as you would expect from Milo. Um, but I also really like the way that Vox does the um, writes the book. So he includes a lot of comments from people on the blog and from comments that people make on his YouTube channel about Jordan Peterson. Now, I have, um, excuse me about the page flipping, I did take notes because there's really a lot to say about this book, but I also don't want to give away too much or else you maybe won't feel inclined to get it. But in any case, I think it's really worth the read. Um, the one thing that I think is really important is that we get accused a lot, of course, of being in a cult, which I think is really far from the truth, but Jordan Peterson's fans are most certainly in a cult. And not just a cult, but a cult, as um, with an O. So anytime you say anything wrong about the Messiah, Jordan Peterson, you will get vitriolic abuse from his fans. Now, it's not because they are actually upholding what he says, it's because they are interpreting what he says in a way that is in line with their perspective. And so they want to defend not him per se, but the fact that he represents them. And so in a way, they're selfishly defending themselves, if that makes sense. It's it's very... Um, convoluted. Okay, so I'm going to pull out a few pages and read to you some excerpts that I think really highlight what is Jordan Peterson's true views and why none of his fans seem to understand this because they're not really listening to him. They're hearing what they want to hear. And this is something Vox talks about really, really well. He says that he kind of um, cold reads the audience. He'll say what he wants to say he sees if the audience responds positively to it and he'll keep going if they don't he'll regroup and say something else so here's just one example people think he's a scientist he's a brilliant guy smart guy okay but he actually denies truth and reality so and actually he denies scientific facts in general so here is a transcript that Vox very kindly provided of him and Sam Harris at this debate thing that they were doing. And listen to what he says. Harris, you clearly have a conception of facts and truth that is possible to know, that exceeds what anyone currently knows, and exceeds any concern about whether it is useful or compatible with our own survival, even to know these truths. A bit convoluted. Anyway, Harris isn't exactly my favorite either. And then Peterson responds, well, then, I would say that I don't think that facts are necessarily true. So I don't think that scientific facts, even if they are correct within the domain that they were generated, I don't think that necessarily makes them true. How can a quote-unquote scientist and not think that scientific facts are true? Okay, then Harris says... The truth value of a proposition can be evaluated whether or not this is a fact worth knowing or whether or not it's dangerous to know. And Peterson says, no, but that's the thing. I don't agree with that because I think that's the kind of conception of what constitutes a fact that does in fact present a moral danger to people. Holy shit that this guy talks like a, like a madman. It's very difficult to keep up. A mortal danger to people. And I also think that that's partly why the scientific endeavor, as it's demolished the, tradi the traditional underpinnings of our moral systems, holy fuck, he's a rambler, has produced an emergent nihilism and hopelessness among people that makes them more susceptible to ideological possession. I think it's a fundamental problem, and I do believe that the highest truths that put it, 
Let's put it that way. The highest truths are moral truths. I'm thinking about that from a Darwinian perspective. Okay, so does Darwin actually think the highest truths are moral truths or are they scientific truths? I don't know, but he seems to think that. And then Harris goes, well, I would expect many people will share my frustration that you're not granting what seem to be just fairly obvious and undeniable facts. And we were having to use, oh, and we now are having to use this concept of truth in a pretty inconvenient way, right? Because I don't see how anyone is going to think that it makes sense because he's redefining what truth is, which is crazy. And then Peterson goes, you know, look, fine. Of course, it's going to be controversial. I mean, the claim I'm making is that scientific truth is nested inside moral truth. And moral truth is the final adjudicator. And your claim is no moral truth is nested inside scientific truth. And scientific truth is the final adjudicator. It's like, fine, you know, those are both coherent positions. And Harris goes, what a great burn. Yeah, but yours actually isn't coherent. <laughs> like, even a guy who is also a bit kooky. Even he cannot get on board with this nonsense about truth. Here's another little excerpt about what, um, what Peterson thinks about truth. And he'll say, well, it depends on what you mean by is. So now we don't know what basic words mean because he wants to redefine them for them to mean what he wants them to mean. Now, another really important thing, again, so this debunks the fact that he is some sort of a scientific genius. Another really shocking revelation that people do not want to know, and I mean, even though it's accessible for people to know, they don't want to accept this, is that Peterson is a globalist. And I mean that in the strictest sense because he actually worked for the UN. And not only did he work for it, his whole goal is to reform it so he actually, he doesn't think that globalism is bad. He thinks that the way that they're going about achieving globalism is bad. It's not palatable for people. And so he wants to make it more easy for people to accept. He does not like nationalism, and he very much does like globalism. And he wants to bring about this utopia, because remember, when he was younger and and this is well-documented, Vox does a great job of, of researching this. When Peterson was 14 years old in Canada, in Alberta, he ran for the NDP party. The NDP is the, um, what is the New Democratic Party. It's pretty much like the Socialist Party, okay? It's more socialist than the liberals, let's just put it that way. And not only that, but I think he was able to win vice president or something like that. And he actually came 13 votes shy of winning. So think about that. This guy was on his journey to, you know, to stardom. And he was actually featured in a local newspaper and he was quoted, and I'm going to quote him here, saying, I won't be happy until I'm elected prime minister. And remember that he did say in an interview not too long ago that he would consider running for prime minister and the only natural party for him to be in was the liberal party not the conservative party the liberal party and remember he said he was doing some focus groups with his um you know advisors about how to go about doing that but he didn't now listen to this the un has listed him as a sherpa so he's some sort of a spiritual guru leader type and that's pretty crazy he is also was invited to attend the trilateral commission uh, meeting in 2018 in slovenia if you're invited to the trilateral commission you are one of those elite type of people who want to remold the world into their vision another thing that we talk a lot about is sustainable development, right? And that's another globalist agenda, 21, 2030 type of goal, right? Well, he also authored that, Resilient People, Resilient Planet, a future worth choosing. Very interesting. So Peterson is in no way on your side. 
In fact, here is what he said about globalism and the United Nations, and it's very telling. The distance between the typical citizen and the bureaucracy that runs the entire structure has got so great that it's an element of destabilization and in and of itself. So people revert back to, say, nationalistic identities because it's something they can relate to. So he wants you to be able to relate to globalism. He doesn't want you to relate to nationalism. He wants you to, in effect, join the global utopia. And he said, I would recommend that people don't do it, as in going nationalistically, because the problem with the radical leftists and their damn identity politics is that it's unbelievably pathological. And if you decide to fight that, fight that by playing the same game, you think, well, I'll play the same game and then I'll win. It's like, you know, you won't because by playing the game, you lose. I don't know if any of you keep up with Canadian politics. Um, it's, it's a bit of a shambles. But P Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, said, if you um, fight the terrorists, you lose. It's a very similar thing to what he Peterson is saying. That's the thing about your political opponent. I'm quoting him again. That's the thing about your political opponents, is that they don't. Is that you don't play their game. Your oh, their damn game. Excuse me. You play a different game. And so you know what I've been trying to encourage people to do instead of playing the collectivist game, and that would include the alt-right identity politics, is to play the individualist game and to get their act together. The best revenge, I would say, you shouldn't be doing it for revenge, but the best revenge against the collectivist left, of the collectivist leftists, is to start a stalwart, meaningful, and high-quality individual life. And that's also the pathway that requires the most responsibility and sacrifice, and I think is the most honorable and less uh, least self-deceptive. Okay, so he wants you to detach yourself from all people and be an individualist. He doesn't want you to love your family or your friends or your group identity or community or country. He wants you to be so engulfed in your own head that you will not have any allegiance to anyone or anything and therefore you will be a prime candidate for indoctrinating with the globalist ideas. So Peterson actually is very dangerous in that regard because people really want to follow him because they think that he's giving such nice dad advice, clean your room, stand up straight, and all the rest of it. But actually everything he's saying is very double meaning, very obviously subversive. But people don't notice that because again, they're projecting what they want to hear from him and internalizing it as if that's what he said. Um, Vox does a really funny, funny piece in the book. He goes, you ask eight Peterson fans what Peterson means by any one of his m rules for life, and you'll get like six different answers, and they'll all be contradictory to one another. So that tells you exactly what I'm trying to explain right now, is that he is intentionally vague. He wants you to fill in the blanks. He doesn't want to pin himself down. He's like, it depends what you mean by is and what you mean by divine and what you mean by Jesus. It's like, well, there's only one thing that is meant by those things. So there's not a whole lot of room for interpretation. Anyways, another thing that is grossly disturbing about Peterson is we talked about the cult of Jordan Peterson, but he also has a very strong messiah slash god complex and what do i mean by that well he seems to very much um he seems to be speaking to his gamma lobsters and gammas do love following a cult they're almost like you know how um what's that psychosocial hierarchy where it's like is it the deltas that like do the hard work and then it's the bravos who like to support the alpha well in the gamma world he's the ga gamma alpha and all his little gammas are not gammas but they're really just like gamma bravos that's what they want to be they really want to support their guy and jordan peterson is that guy so uh there's a psychiatrist who he quotes and this is also well documented by social scientists about what actually a cult is is and it has certain criteria and this guy is from harvard 
So three, three uh, qualities of a cult. Uh, a charismatic leader who increasingly becomes an object of worship as the general principles that may have originally sustained the group lose their power. So it's no longer about his rules for life. It's no longer about lobsters and cleaning your room. It's about Peterson. And if you say anything about Peterson and any of the comments section will prove this to you. Oh my God, you changed my life. Oh my God, you're so amazing. Oh my God, I love you, Peterson. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if anyone disagrees they are going to get hazed for sure. They're definitely going to get mobbed. Second uh, characteristic of a cult, a process I call coercive per persuasion or thought reform. Okay, so he, by these rules, self-help, quote unquote, he wants you to reform yourself. He wants you to change how you think from loving your nation, wanting to have a family, have because we all have group identities however um quote individualist we may be in the sense that the individual is important and you cannot just sacrifice people for the sake of the group you are always part of a group you are part of your family your friend circle your work circle your neighborhood your community country so forth you're always part of a group you cannot detach yourself from a group so when he says radical individualism what does that really mean Okay, so he wants to reform you and coercively persuade you to do so. And the third one is economic, sexual, or other exploitation of group members by the leader and the ruling kind of the other people who are in, in the ruling um, group. Okay, actually, it's funny because Owen did the stream yesterday. He was ending the stream and he talked exactly about this, saying, like, I'm not a cult. I never want to fuck any of my people. Like, I only want to be with Amy. And I don't, like, force you to pay for anything. If you want to send me money, great. If you don't, I'll still read your letter. I don't care. I do this for free. And he's not forcing us to change what we think. He's friends with people who believe in the globe earth and the flat earth. It doesn't really matter to him so long as you're an honest and decent person. That's fine. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, that's, if you don't check these boxes, then you can't really be a cult. And he checks all these boxes and more. Now, this Messiah complex thing that he has, he oftentimes refers to his suffering and his path in life compared to Jesus's suffering and Jesus's path in life. And that's, to any believer, it, that's blasphemous and that is also really disturbing because even if you don't believe, it's like you think you're on the level of Jesus? Like, whoa, that is narcissism at least. And yeah, God complex at the worst. So here's another little quote from the book. He has a melancholy charisma and generates audience sympathy, sympathy through his emotions. He'll laugh, he'll cry, he'll rant, he'll fall into sudden silences, glare, um, into the camera or wag his finger at the audience. He'll draw upon his outdated rustic colloquialisms, bucko, and, hypothet and hypnotically inspell his viewers with his disarming, soft-spoken Canadian accent. Very true. So that's what Vox says about him. So he also, not only does he think that he is some version of Christ, but he also, like Shapiro likes to deny the deity and divinity of Christ. And how can he both deny Christ and then say he acts as if God exists? And that's, you know, nominally he's a Christian, but he's not really a Christian because he's not really fully sure of what that means. He's just a bullshit artist, really. There's no other way to sum it up. Um, he is deeply into the occult. The, his obsession with Jung, Jung himself was an occultist. In fact, my professor told me this when I was studying psychology. He said, when Jung and Freud first met, because Freud's dodgy already, but Jung is more, more so than he is. So when Jung and Freud met, Jung was doing some like talking with the dead and spirits and something like that. And it freaked out Freud so badly that he passed out. He fainted from being spooked so hard. And in fact, that happened the second time they met as well. Like, this guy is crazy. Jung is crazy. So all these people um, that he likes to worship, 
if you read what his, um, and I really highly recommend the book because you will see the comparisons and I don't want to, as I said, give away too much, but I do want to sort of highlight the point of what Vox and Peterson are doing here. Peterson draws a lot on like Aleister Crowley, who we know is a Satanist. He also like follows, and the reason it's called Jordanetics is because he follows the kind of template of Dianetics where um, L. Ron Hubbard also has sort of made a religion out of himself. And that's that's part of his thing. He thinks that you can ascend to Christ consciousness and ascend to um, your higher being with a capital B and... Um, by by going into the underworld of hell and suffering and chaos and pain, then you can begin to master the higher truths. And this is just like ridiculous because that's not necessarily how it works. Like he's talking about enlightenment and enlightenment as we know, the light bearer. This is a pure Luciferian doctrine that he's promoting, but he's sort of hiding it like in such a way where the uninitiated will just see some rules for life that seem pretty harmless and then maybe some little philosophical existential bullshit and you think, oh, this guy's super deep, like he must get it. I don't get it, so maybe he must get something that I don't get. So he's sort of subduing his more um, intellectual readers. But then those who are sort of initiated, who understand his metaphors and so forth, he's also speaking to two people at once, right? The the agnostic, people who are without this hidden knowledge, and to the Gnostics, which is another huge um, philosophy that he draws on and tries to uh, indoctrinate you with. So there's a lot of secret meaning and duality in his text. And there's a lot of, as I said, projection and the fans that listen to him, it's pure ideal, it's pure idolatry. They idolize him, as I said, to the point that it doesn't matter anymore what he's saying. The people like him and that's all that matters. Okay, and then he talks about his um, psychotic friend who killed himself and nearly had a murderous fit with his own friends but the, uh, with his own family but then he says something very strange and of course he's a hypocrite so he's not going to apply this to himself but this is the quote that um, Vox has at the beginning of the chapter and I think it's really interesting because it sort of highlights exactly the point that Peterson will not address with himself. So he says, when the structure of an institution has become corrupt, particularly according to its own principles, it is the act of a friend to criticize it. So if it's the act of a friend to criticize one's corruption, whether it be institutional or what have you, then why does he not accept criticism? Why is it that friend to friend, you want to you know, tell him, hey, I think you're on the wrong path. I think you need to, you know, be saved and repent and all the rest of it. I think you're leading your uh, fan base astray. The thing that I find really disturbing is that a lot of his fans will say, oh, he's brought me to Jesus. But has he brought you to Jesus? Because it seems that he's brought you to the occult Jesus. When I was listening to him, he explains Jesus as a symbolic figure that you transcend yourself through suffering and you're reborn and all the rest of it, like all this imagery. And you think, yeah, I mean, that doesn't not make sense. I mean, I, I get that, right? But then I actually came to study and understand and I realized, oh my God, this guy's so full of shit. And he is exactly confusing people because this is what the devil does, right? He wants you to believe in anything except for the truth, anything except for the real Jesus. So whatever Jesus caricature he wants to make, you can go ahead and believe in that. You can even think you're saved, but you're not because you don't believe in the truth, the way, not whatever stuff comes into your head that you think you're super smart by thinking it. So, as I said, he's a, he's a hypocrite and is guilty of exactly the thing that he says. He doesn't want to be criticized. He doesn't want to 
um, reform himself in any way. Then he talked a little bit about um, this spoiled kid. And it's funny because he, the term that he used, I never knew that it was a Peterson term because I hear people saying this term about Trump and about memes in general. It's the God Emperor meme, right? He called this spoiled little boy who always had his way, quote, the God Emperor. And it's funny because he himself thinks of himself as the God Emperor. And like, what a very interesting choice of words that one would use, um, especially about a child. So he said, did he choose to be the God Emperor of the universe? And it's it's very funny, like they're kids. Kids, of course, are self-centered and you need to discipline them properly. But he almost like resents this child for being able to have his way. Like it's very, very strange. Um, what else did I want to say? Two more points and then that's really all I want to say. Um, yeah, I guess just overall, there's so much interesting stuff in this book and I really think that uh, you should read it. I love um, the part where he had inserted, <clears throat> excuse me, where he put in the comments from other people and saying like, oh, you're just jealous. Oh my God, you haven't written a best-selling book. It's like, I think Vox has published like 16 books or something. This guy's published two and both of them are bullshit. <laughs> um, you know, so it's like he's divulging how he like wants to stroke his grandma's pubes and sh like bone his cousin and things like that. Like that is not normal. That is not normal at all. Whereas Vox is actually a really good writer. So um, how could you say he's jealous? I thought it was really funny how um, Vox will say like, well, for a man who has, let's just say a pretty wife, why would I be jealous of someone who doesn't? <laughs> That's great. It's funny. It's true. I really don't know how these two got together. I mean, like she's... um she looks more manly than Peterson does, for goodness sake. In any case, the takeaway message from this book is that you don't want to take life advice from deeply troubled men. Vox is very clear about calling Peterson evil, and I actually think that he, he is actually being very evil because this is not simple naivete where he doesn't know. He presents himself as an expert. He presents himself as clinical psychologist, a professor. Oh, I'm a researcher and I've written books and bestseller. And oh my goodness, I'm just such an important person. So you're giving people life lessons. You're telling people how to live their life, what they should and should not do, what even faith to have and not have and how to question everything and detach yourself from people or whatever. And yet, you know, I know we like to joke about him being in rehab for meth or whatever, but Whatever the point is, is he cannot overcome his own demons. And yet he's telling us how to overcome ours. It's not the same as, you know, when your parents are smoking and they say, don't smoke. This is far worse than a bad habit. This is a lifelong pursuit of something vile. He doesn't want to accept the truth of the Bible. He doesn't. He didn't even read the Bible before he decided to do a Bible series. How can someone do that? It's like me saying, I'm going to do a book review, but I haven't actually read this book. That's something like his students would do, you know, when they haven't done the homework, but they're going to bullshit their way through it. But he's the professor. That's the weirdest thing about it. Imagine, like, he had that client, he was talking about that woman who, who thought she was raped five times, but he couldn't even help her acknowledge that she was or maybe come to the conclusion that she wasn't he just left her there in limbo for years just churning it over churning it over like she didn't know what the hell happened and she paid this guy to like abuse her pretty much unbelievable unbelievable so yeah it's not simply that he's confused or doesn't know or wants to hedge his bets he knows he knows but he doesn't want you to know he doesn't want to pin himself down but by dancing around the point, he has pinned himself down as a liar and a deceiver. And we all know where lies and deception come from and who is the father of it. And I think he knows that too. You know, he keeps saying, give the devil his due. Oh yeah, give the devil his due. Well, you sure gave him his freaking due and then some, didn't you? Anyways, I ultimately think, I think he is hurting people on a grand scale. Like there was a moment 
even Owen has a little thing saying like, oh, I feel really duped that I trusted this guy. He has a quote in the book. I also feel that way too. I was talking to, you know, my husband, like he was watching me or listening to me, like saying, oh, wow, this guy's so cool. And like I read his book and everything. And I have his book still. If anyone wants it, you can have it for free. (laughs) Anyway. And then he's like, oh, what happened? You don't like him anymore? And it's like, well, yeah, I don't actually, because I feel stupid that I was duped by him. And I went to see his talk. And I actually, when I read the book, I thought, gosh, this isn't that great. But I have seen his talks and maybe he's just not a good writer. But then he says things like, I will rewrite a sentence 30 times before I'm happy with it. So he wrote, rewrote this garbage 30 times each sentence before he was happy with it where does he have that time to do that when he'll go to like 150 cities in like 120 you know 20 days or something like that I don't know how he does that he doesn't he says he didn't sleep for 25 days is that humanly possible I don't think it is you know I I I just once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it's there's nothing wrong with admitting that you are wrong. And that's fine. I really, really, really highly recommend you read the um, appendix, appendix A at the back where he addresses the JQ, if you will. It talks about the IQ of a um, certain group of people who shall remain unnamed for obvious reasons. And um, another group of people, bike owners, as we like to call them now, and how that data has been improperly applied, not applicable, actually, in a lot of cases. It's outdated, and ultimately, it's just sort of a myth, and it's being perpetuated, and I think that's very important to see the actual um, studies that he's referring to. He also misquotes data and comes to the opposite conclusion that the data says and so he's a very sneaky person he is a liar and he has said in his book that he is a liar and he has to stop himself from lying which I don't think he does very well obviously so there are two things really at the end of the book that I think you'll find really interesting he has 12 questions for Jordan Peterson so he says if you ever get a Q&A ask him these questions so I recommend that you check that out And then Vox offers like his own 12 rules for life. And I think that they're like good, you know, like they're just good rules. I mean, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this, but I'll just like, I'll just say the titles of them. And then that way, you know, you could always read the rest for yourself. So he'll say like one, embrace the iron. So he's talking about like lifting weights and why that's a good thing. Take the wheel, you know, like being in charge of your own life. Be the friend you want to have. Envision perfection and pursue excellence. Put a ring on it. We're not talking about marriage and family. Um, Set your face against evil. Do what is right. Tell the truth in kindness. Learn the easy way. That is to say, don't make stupid mistakes. Believe the mirror, but don't be too harsh on yourself. Get back on the horse. Find a best friend. Like the, those, those are the type of humble but simple and true rules and advice that one could live by. It's the reason Jordan is so uh, deceptive is because his rules sound like that. They sound like simple, easy, basic truisms from the dad you never had sort of thing, but they're not. And he goes chapter by chapter, rule by rule, exactly, you know, telling you exactly why it's bullshit. Basically, the takeaway message of Jordan Peterson is to be um, mediocre to be in the middle, which he calls the balance, a more perfect order, excuse me, not too much order that's tyrannical and not so little order that it's chaos, but right in the middle. Make sure that there's someone beneath you and make sure that you don't rise too high because then you're an oppressor. That's nonsense. And of course, people think, oh, that's good. You want to be in average, right in the middle. That's a safe place to be. It's not, though. It's not. And what kind of a person doesn't want to strive to do the best that they they can? Like, it just makes no sense. Anyway, basically, (laughs) should you buy this book? Yes. Um, Out of five stars, I would definitely say like four and a half to five for sure. Easily. It's very good, very easy to read. I read it quite quickly. Um, If I had 
the time to read it through. It would probably just take me a couple days, but it I did read it over the course of like five days. But again, because I was doing stuff during the day, so morning and evening I had a time to read it, so it was really good. Um, it's funny. I love the jabs <laughs> that um, Vox takes. It's clever, of course. You know that he is. Um, he's funnier than he gives himself credit for. Of course, Milo is scathing. The only thing that I would say about Milo is like, he's a very clever guy in the sense that he can write this forward slagging off Jordan. And then, I don't know, what was it like a month or two ago, he was doing a live stream with Jordan Peterson. So he knows that it's going to be publicity for him to do it. And I get that. Um, I just personally, I don't know if like that's the highest level of integrity, but anyway, it is what it is. Um, doesn't, doesn't really matter. So yeah, like I said, I recommend getting the book. It was given to me for my birthday. So thanks hubby. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, I think you'll really like it. And, um, if nothing, you'll get a good laugh at it, but you will certainly learn something about him and you will be better armed when you have these, uh, debates, discussions, conversations with his fans, and you will be able to concretely not just say, oh, he's stupid, oh, don't you know he's lying to you, you'll be able to concretely say why he is a deceiver, here's an example of what he said, a direct quote, this is from his book, go to that page and find it, go and look at one of his videos, he said this, da 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 da, and if you don't want to believe your lying eyes, as they say, then there's really nothing we can do for you, so... In any case, um, that's really all I have to say. I'm going to go and tune into um, Owen's live stream next, so I won't take up any of your time. See you guys over there, and um, hope you found this helpful.